what we're going to do here, first of all, is mute everybody and that, um, we'll get our business portion of the, the meeting underway and we'll introduce our very special speaker this morning. And then um, what we usually do after uh, our speaker for about 15 or 20 minutes, we will then uh, ask for anybody who wants to have discussion, questions and so on. And we'll uh, up, give you the opportunity to unmute yourself. And if you're on a phone connection, which it looks like maybe just one person I think is right now, then um, we'll unmute you and give you the opportunity to uh, <coughs> ask questions because it's not always easy when somebody is on a phone, they can't always unmute themselves if we've muted them. Right. So um, give me one second here. All righty. I was going to um, just uh, start by saying, giving since we have a lot of people from our district on the phone today. Um, so I'm starting to prepare for the newsletter. If your club um, has anything special uh, going on that you've been doing in the midst of this crisis, um, I would love to hear about it. A picture and a paragraph would, would really help me out. Also, um, if you want to do Zoom meetings at your own clubs, we, of course, um, welcome you to do that. We do have some connections that the district bought um, to facilitate those meetings. And all that I need you to do is to write me, you know, obviously your club name, the date that you're requesting and the time. Uh, we try to keep them to no more than one hour because um, Zoom is actually, um, as you can imagine, a little overwhelmed with the requests. And then the only other thing I ask that you let me know is whether that is a meeting that can be posted on the website or newsletter to encourage other Rotarians to come to it or whether it's a closed meeting, and then I do not um, publish any information about it. So anyway, that's available, and my email is sue at goldson.com. Thanks, Sue. Um, and just a reminder, especially for those of you who have never joined us before, whether you're within District 6400 or somewhere else, um, these Passport Club meetings are open to all Rotarians. We are going to, in the next uh, few weeks, be... Uh, um, chartering and we're going to give you more information if you know somebody who would like to join our club uh, just a, a quick 30 second reminder of what a passport club is we are a hybrid between a traditional rotary club that has regular meetings in a physical location and an e-club which only meets online and we're a hybrid because we meet online but we also want our members to get involved in their local communities um, and it's particularly passport club is great for people who don't keep regular schedules, can't make the, uh, the rigorous, rigorous demands of a, uh, a weekly or biweekly meeting at the same place because they travel or they have their snowbirds and they go to different locations during the course of the year. So we encourage uh, all people to, uh, who have that kind of a schedule to consider joining our passport club. Um, so without any further ado, actually I'm going to put her on the spot here right now. Uh, Suzanne Gruet, who's a member of the, Rotary Club of Windsor Walkerville uh, was with us last week um, and suggested that we get in touch with uh, this person uh, who's going to be our special guest speaker this morning and uh, because she thought that uh, during this time of COVID-19 this might be uh, an excellent opportunity to have somebody who uh, whose uh, field of, of, of uh, study and field, uh, where she works vocation is um, mental health so uh, I think uh, it couldn't be a more appropriate time to do that. So Suzanne, I'm going to unmute you here. And if you don't mind, and if you do mind, you can tell me. Um, but uh, we'd love to have you uh, kind of briefly introduce uh, this morning's speaker, if you, if you would. Well, that would be great. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, Yvette Marie is joining us today, and Yvette and I uh, became friends through my cousin, and uh, we've attended all kinds of sporting events and, and fun activities together. She's a fun gal, but uh, during this time especially, I've uh, found her to be a great wealth of inspiration uh, for a number of reasons, um, she is a uh, certified mental health uh, coach and trainer, and um, I find that being a, a social butterfly, uh, self-proclaimed social butterfly, and I'm usually out and about, I'm almost never home, 
um, this 24-7 stuff at home is, uh, is challenging at, at, at best. And so I find the things that uh, Yvette has to say, and, and she's really stepped up on, uh, on Facebook and other platforms to, uh, to help people like me uh, get through this craziness. So, um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, have uh, Yvette tell us a little bit about how we can get through this craziness. Am I good? Am I good? Yeah. Thank you so much, Suzanne. That was lovely. And you look fabulous. Look at the smile. And see how we do in life, too. We smile sometimes when we're not feeling necessarily like smiling. Um, and it's just sort of that uh, thing that we do automatically, thinking that's the way that we are. So that's what people expect of us. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is that at this point in time, um, our expectations of ourselves should be thrown out the window. Because truthfully, no one has ever gone through this at any point in time in their lives. This is a new experience for all of us. Um, and so I hear I got 15 minutes and I have a whole bunch of tips. So I'm just really going to go intuitively um, what I'm, I'm feeling the need to share with you. And then maybe some of the other stuff might come out through the questions and answering uh, period that you might have. Um, so just to, off the top, when we talk about mental health, so I'm a, I'm a, a mental health first aid, basic uh, first aid instructor. And so what I do as a core is I teach people how um, to recognize the signs, symptoms of mental health disorders or diseases or crises and how to get the best help. Um, and I have, I teach some skills about how to support someone while they're going through it. So what I find fascinating in this time of COVID-19 is that we need it for ourselves too, that um, when you're there to support another is how can we actually support ourselves um, while we're going through this as well. So um, mental health, when I teach it, I, I, I always ask the attendees, you know, who here has mental health? And then a few brave, brave people raise their hands. And uh, because there's this misconception or stigma around mental health, that uh, if you have mental health, it means that you have a disorder or a problem. But that's really not the case. We all have mental health. So I describe it like this. So like if everybody just wants to put out their arm out here and just give it a bit of a jiggle, right? You can see that it's outside of your body right? But it's connected to your body. It's still part of your body, like your mind, your mind and your brain are still connected to your body. So I'd love to get to a place in society and community where we now go with mental health is rather than mental health or physical health, how is your physical or how is your mental to say, how is your health? Because it's one and whole where it's a wholeness it's a complete of us. So I, I always feel necessary to speak to that to begin with to really get rid of some of that stigma around mental health. And recognizing that any point in times in our lives, we all have, right now, we're collectively going through a big thing in our lives, but we all have moments where things happen, stressors, even good stressors, getting married, having a baby, buying a home, even those kinds of things are stressors and can affect people in different ways. Um, so recognizing that if you're feeling um, anxiety right now, this is a very normal and natural feeling to be feeling. Um, it, some people have had previous anxiety issues and it's just either triggering them or they're managing it very well. So here's the thing. You're, everyone is different in how we cope and we manage with stressors. So for yourself, if you're, uh, I call it the Martha Stewart Baker, because I have moments where I get up in the morning, like first thing in the morning and I, I go, I, I just want to create. So I'll go and I'll cook healthy food for myself that I know is going to make me feel good. And I have a whole other segment on that. Um, or there's days where I wake up and I'm going, you know, just even to brush my teeth today is going to be a big deal. And so what I'm inviting you to do is give yourself permission to actually feel what it is that you're feeling, that you have to remember that your emotions need motion. So that tendency of, you know, well, I got it pretty good. I got a roof over my head. I still have a job that I can work online. I can still do these things. I should, I, I shouldn't feel this way. But the truth is you, it's very natural to feel this way. Um, right now, collectively, we're going through grief. Uh, we talk about the different stages of grief. So you have the, um, the, the, the denial, right? Ah, it's no big deal, this COVID-19 thing. It'll be over in a couple of weeks. And, oh, they're making a big hoopla out of it. You know, all this fake false news, that kind of stuff, right? Um, then we go through that bargaining. Uh, okay, so if I stay home for two weeks, I just have to stay home for 14 days. And once that's over with, uh, then okay, okay, then we're on to it, right? And then you get into anger. 
what do you mean I have to stay home for 14 days? What do you mean you don't know that it could be longer? Right. Um, and what we're all going through right now is what they call anticipatory grief. It's that anticipation of something going to happen. Uh, quite often you might get it with the fear of a death of a loved one. Right. So we're in that state of well, what happens if this person dies. Right. Um, so and, and, and what happens if I can't keep my job and that fear of the future? And that creates a lot of anxiety. So one of the, one of the tips that I, I, um, I suggest you do is focus on if you're in a period of anxiety um, and you're thinking about the future to come back to the now. What is actually happening in this moment? And it could be as simple as, you know what, I haven't eaten yet. I need to put a boiled egg on. I need to make myself a coffee. It could be as simple as, you know what, it's, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I still have my pajamas on. Uh, my hair is a mess, and I haven't brushed my teeth. So maybe that focusing on the right now is, you know what, all I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go brush my teeth. That's all. Just that one little action to get you out of that state of anxiety. If you're in a place where um, maybe uh, you're working or you're studying or you're focused on something or you're going over and over your mind of what if, what if, what if, change your scenery. That's another tip. Literally change your scenery. You can go and, and sit in the living room as opposed to the kitchen or go to the bedroom or go to the bathroom. When you change your environment and your surroundings, that shifts your mind as well um, and what you're focusing on. Um, Focus on what you can do, because yes, there's lots of things we can't do right now as, as, as a country and as, as, a, as a world as a whole, but focus on the things that you can do. Um, look, reaching out. So I find for myself, whenever I get myself in a place of anxiety, when I think of uh, outside of myself, so that's another way. So yes, I'm encouraging you to think inside yourself, but if you find that that's not helping to think outside of yourself, how can I support another how, how uh, volunteering, uh, checking in on your neighbors. I know Suzanne, you 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 had the fish and chips uh, last night and brought them to your, uh, drop them off at your relative's door. Those things are, are, are of great gesture and make you feel good. We we took a drive. We needed to do something, so we just took a drive and dropped off a care package at a relative's home yesterday. Um, these are things that gets you outside of yourself. So when you find that you're too much inside yourself and your mind's spinning, to actually step out. Where where can I be of assistance? Um, if, if in your area you are allowed to go for a walk and you're making sure you have that physical distance, you know, literally look up and smile at someone. Um, I've done it a few times where I've gone for a walk and, and, and yes, we have to physical distance. It doesn't mean we can't have social personal connection and, and heads, heads are down and no eye contact. Cause if I make eye contact, I might get the COVID, right? So it's really important to remember our basic human functions. These are things right now that we do have control of. So find things that you do have control of and utilize those as well. Um, having empathy, empathy for others and empathy for ourselves. So empathy, uh, you know, it's not sympathy. Empathy is connecting yourself with another person and what they might be going through. They might have a different experience of you. They may, they may uh, have, have go, you know what, I'm always working from home. This is no big deal for me. This is nothing new for me, right? But if I now said, oh, this is nothing, don't worry about it, how would that make you feel? So it's important to really just connect with another person and not and just listen to them. The power of listening non-judgmentally is huge. So when you're listening non-judgmentally, it's really important uh, not to put your belief systems or how you think the world should be onto someone else to really give that space that this isn't your life or your experience. It's that other person's. And so quite often we have, I'm one of them, the caregivers that want to make everything better for everybody, right? Uh, you know, coming onto calls like this and all the teachings that I do in the webinars, there's this bit of pressure I put on myself and I have to keep it in check because I'd like everyone to feel better. That, that you don't have to feel this way. But the truth is we are in it. And it's only up to you to support yourself and making yourself feel better in the moment. Um, things like these types of calls, Zoom calls, you're already doing one of the tips. And that is to reach out, to find community. Thank goodness for Zoom, right? Isn't that amazing that Zoom has got this system set up um, that we can all connect? Yes, it's not in person. Um, but still, I can see Suzanne's face now right, right in my screen there, right? So it, it's still being able to have that connection, that person. Um, so we talk, okay, and crying. It's another one. So we talk about grief and we talk about crying. Um, another one is really to allow your tears to come. And the reason I say this is because it actually is a soother. 
when you really give yourself the permission to really cry, I mean, I'm talking the ugly cry. I'm talking let it out, like right from the core of your gut, just let it out. Um, because what happens is the parasympathetic nervous system releases oxytocin and um, a, a dopamine, and those are feel-good emotions. So even though in the moment it's like, no, I don't want to cry and stop it, these, emo these, these um, uh, enzymes and uh, endorphins come through your body and actually helps relieve stress. So it is a stress reliever. I'll share with you uh, a personal story uh, with you. My uh, mom uh, died in uh, July of this year, and uh, she died of cancer, uh, and it was unexpected. Uh, I, I was uh, away, and I flew back to be with her for the last month in hospital. And just as the doctors are telling her, um, and I know I'm sure you all can relate to that feeling of when you have a loved one lying there, and there's absolutely nothing that you can do, and they basically tell her that uh, palliative care, and she's, she's, on her, uh, she's riddled with cancer. And my mom, who was also a mental health advocate, um, very powerful woman, uh, in, in, in hearing this dreadful news, she looks at my father and my partner, Dave, and I, and she says, okay, now, let's all have a good cry. And in that moment, she gave us permission to really have a good cry. And the cry didn't change what was going to happen with my mom. It didn't change the circumstances but it allowed us to connect as a family to really feel the feelings. Cause you've got to remember when you deny your feelings, they end up building up. And then eventually it's like that, it's like that water faucet. Um, and if you don't allow it to flow, eventually it'll spurt out everywhere and it'll spurt out in anger bursts. It'll spurt out in, in uh, self-loathing. It'll spurt out in anxiety. It'll spurt out in many different ways. So please, I suggest, I always say invite, I say invite too much. But I, I suggest that when those feelings start to surface, allow them to unfold. I used to have a big fear that if I really allowed my tears and my sadness to come through, that I might snap, that I might not be able to come back from it. But I'm here to tell you, you will come back from it. And it will be better for you for doing it. Um, and another thing to note, that just because someone is sad doesn't mean that they're depressed. Quite often when we see someone uh, 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 tearing, crying, we think that that's depression. It's not. You're allowed to be sad. And right now is a very sad time. So as much as I'd love to come on here and give you tips on, on how to, uh, how, how to um, be all, you know, feeling good, right now you might not feel good. And I'm giving you permission to not feel good, that that's okay, because it's going through it, you come out of it. So hopefully those are helpful. I'm just, I made a few notes here. I want to make sure that I got everything in here. Um, and gratitude is another big one. Uh, being focused on what you, you are doing. Uh, uh, you know, what we tend to do, and I've seen it all over social media and people I've spoken with is, you know, look what they're doing. They're not keeping the six feet distance. And, and why are there visitors over at that house? And this is not right. And I invite you to come back to you. What is it that you are doing? How are you contributing? Because the minute you, 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 you go outside and you look at what other people are doing, that creates an anxiety in itself. So right now we have control of what, over what we do. We don't have control over what other people do. So when you find yourself in that them, 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 and over there, over there, come back to what is it that you can do um, to make a difference. Uh, and then gratitude. Having gratitude... Uh, you know, that, that, that the sun is shining, that, that you have a roof over your head. If you've got kids running around, you're like, oh, noisy kids. Gratitude that they're young, healthy, and vibrant, and they're running around. Uh, you've got an inbox full of emails. You're having gratitude that, that means I have clients. That means I'm busy. That means I'm working. So really shifting that perspective of, oh, man, to focusing on what's good about it, what's finding some gratitude. Here, here right now, we're in a period where we've been given a gift, and the gift of, is stillness. A gift is a chance to reset. Maybe this is a chance for you to look and see, how was my life before COVID-19? Are there some things when this new normal come back that maybe I'm going to do differently? Maybe there might be some stuff that doesn't come with you into the next phase of your life. So it's an opportunity for you to stop and actually reflect and take advantage of that. Um, I, I, I think that's a good, we're at about 15 minutes now. So I'm open to questions on how I can support anyone further. It, does that feel good, Bruce? Yeah, no, I think that's great. You know, it's interesting. We, 
the things that run through my mind during this period are, first of all, human beings naturally have this desire for connection and socialness and all these Facebook memories that keep coming up on our pages or, hey, you know, three years ago at this day, you were together at this concert or, you know, and, and so now it's, it's almost a nagging reminder that, yeah, we did that, but we can't do that right now. So I think people are looking for alternatives. And, and you really struck a chord with me um, when you were just talking about um, pe people, there's a difference between depression and sadness. And I think it's amplified by our, our, our being forced right now to focus on social media and on online. Uh, a, a friend of mine on Facebook, not a close friend, but a, a longtime acquaintance has been, uh, he lives in, in Los Angeles and he's been, posting all the time on Facebook about how he is scared to go out and there's people everywhere that are, you know, not social distancing and, and his posts look more and more desperate and, and he couldn't find a mask and, and whatever. And so people started like posting on his page where, you know, we're worried for you and, you know, it's going to be okay and whatever. And he finally wrote a post like yesterday that said, Hey, you know, everybody, I'm good. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm upset about these things, but I'm not depressed, you know, and I know, I know that it's going to get better. And he's like, and I, I guess my posts looked like I was desperate, but I'm really not. And they did look like he was desperate. It's just the way he came across. Mm -hmm. So I think people, you know, to your point, have to really be, you know, in, engaged in how they come across on social media versus in person, because you, you might have detected it differently or engaged in a conversation differently. And allowing that space for the person to express how they're feeling and not for us to have to come and resolve it and solve it. That's not for us to do it. Even just creating that environment where someone can talk about what they're really feeling, not be judged by it or someone trying to fix it. Um, you got to remember that we are not our, our experiences. So what I mean by that is that it's something that we're going through, but that's not who we are. It's an experience that we're having. So, for example, if, uh, I'll use the word, if you feel um, worthless, I feel worthless. That doesn't mean that you are worthless. That's just a feeling that you're going through. So this is something that he might have gone through in that moment, but that doesn't define who he is. Um, and similar to the way we label people. So in, especially with mental health um, illnesses, it could be, um, you know, oh, he's, he's schizophrenic or they're bipolar. No, they're not bipolar schizophrenic. They're living with that or that's their experiencing or they're fighting it or battling it, however way you want to hurt it. That's not who they are. That's what they're going through right now. So COVID-19 is not who we are. It's an experience that we're having, right? So it's important not to label the person that that person is desperate, maybe had desperate thoughts in that moment. And what you, you brought up a thought to me around his expression of not finding masks and being scared to go out. Well, this is also a form of anxiety. And for some people, you know, I, I, I often hear because I'm part of a lot of communities um, right now that are that uh, with mental health illnesses and disorders. And they're, they're kind of laughing going, well, now everyone gets to understand what I go through on a regular basis for years, right? And, and so I, I often go back to, again, it's everyone's experience. Just because someone experienced it before, there's no comparison. It's not for us to compare, well, my, my, my illness or my response is worse than yours. No, for ourselves, it's our own experiences. So I invite you not to compare yourself to others. Well, if they're going through that, then I shouldn't feel this way. No, feel it. That's great advice. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Yvette. Um, so we, um, we've had a couple of people who've weighed in on our chat window here, and Steve Alice, uh, who's from the Southgate Club and is our district membership chair, has, uh, uh, is asking, how do we support the frontline healthcare workers, I think you, who are dealing with those who need them? You know, so to, to your point about, you know, even, even mental health professionals who work in this field, you know, you, you've got you've got issues sometimes. So, is what what kind of reach outs do you do you look for from your friends or your people, people like Suzanne or whatever? Yeah, I, I absolutely love that question. Thank you for asking it, um, because. When we go to help other people, we tend to forget ourselves. I saw an interview on CBC News World yesterday, and, it, and it was, there was a doctor, and she was asking, I think it was Anne Marie who was asking, um, you know, how are you doing? And then she went right into talking about a patient or what it's like at the hospital. And she goes, you know, what's interesting is most often caregivers and what, what they end up doing is they focus on other people. So being, um, you know, how, be if paying attention for those of you that are supporters and caregivers on the front line. And it doesn't have to be, 
you know, in a hospital, it doesn't have to be at a grocery store. It could literally be in your own home. It could be to your children. It could be to your significant other. And guess what? It can be for yourself too. Being that support for yourself. How are you going to be in self-care? How do you take care of yourself? So how do I come back to how to best support me? For me, uh, when I do these kinds of talks, uh, it gives me energy. It gives me passion. It gives me hope. It gives me sense of purpose. So this helps me manage my own mental health. It gives me something to work towards. So how you could support me in particular is spread the word. Allow other people to know to know about me and how I support other people. Um, I actually did a, a webinar um, a couple of weeks ago called the Mental Health Toolbox for COVID-19. And it's a free webinar I did. It's two hours long. And I share with loads of tips. They can just simply go to mentalhealthtrainer.ca. And I can actually put it in the chat afterwards as well. Mentalhealthtrainer.ca. Just sign up there and I'll send you the link for the webinar. Um, and that's my gift to you, my give back. Because, you know, it's the old Jerry Maguire, help me help you. Right. Uh, and and I, I, I learned this philosophy probably about last year when I started really taking care of my body and the foods that I chose to eat. And, and, and my, my mission and my philosophy was this to be a service. I'm being of service to others while I'm being of service to myself. Because, you know, that whole uh, airplane when the oxygen mask comes down and they say, give it to yourself first, because you're going to be no good to anyone else unless you take care of yourself. So I'm an advocate for self care. Take care of yourself first. Then you can be of support to others. So I, I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure if, if I hit all the spots there. No, I think that was great. Um, a couple of things that have popped up here I want to just uh, reference. Marty, who's from uh, New York area, New York City in particular. Um, Marty, did you want to kind of talk about this, uh, uh, this new uh, global impact uh, group? If you unmute yourself, uh, you can... Uh, Thank you, Bruce. Know, Thanks for... About it. Thanks for the opportunity, Bruce. I, I was on a, a Zoom call in my district with uh, Rotary Director Jeff Cataret last night, and uh, Rotary is partnering with the Global Impact Group, a group formed in 2019 to address uh, crises very much uh, anticipatory of what we're facing now. The Global Impact Group has a website, very important for all Rotarians, take a note of this website. It is tgig.org. At that website, you can explore a flowchart that explains how Rotarians and friends of Rotarians, people in your spheres, people that are in your family, can help on the, to assist the frontline healthcare workers. It's a pretty involved process. There's a platform that came uh, out of this group that's uh, very sophisticated. You can take two courses that are free of charge. One is a 30 hour course that'll enable you to get a certificate as a certified nursing assistant. Very important in this health crisis. The other is a 10 hour course that enables you to be telecommunicating and helping that way from your own home, from your own phone. There's a third avenue if you're already a health professional and don't need training. So it's open to quite a bit. They're looking to do something called the Volunteer Surge, which is to gain 1 million volunteers through this affiliation to go out and attack this crisis. And if you look ahead of this to a point where eventually we'll have, we'll have uh, put this under, under our belt and have a vaccine and treatments, this Volunteer Surge can be something very useful for Rotary and for volunteers around the world in future crises. Thank you. Any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Great, thanks, Marty. Um, and you can always put uh, questions in the chat box as well. We appreciate you once again being on with us this morning. Um, so question for you, Yvette. Um, one of the things that maybe gives me a little bit of anxiety for our world is how we all are gonna be shaped on the other side of this, both from a mental, um, family, business, all of it. I mean, life is going to be, in my mind, different. Maybe I'm over, um, over dramatizing that. I don't know. But I, I, I certainly worry about how do we all go back to living life and feeling safe um, in this, after the other side of this. That's a great question, Sue, and you're not over-dramatizing. It's very natural to, again, that anticipatory grief and what if, what if. Um, the truth is we don't know. Um, and so I've always, for me, uh, 
okay, we don't know what's going to happen. It, it, it could be in any scenario. So we use the COVID as an example. What's going to happen as a new normal? Um, so we can go into a place of stress, right? Our adrenals are, are going crazy and, and, and we're not managing very well thinking about the future. Um, or, or we don't think about the future and what's going to happen and, and actually experiences a gradual approach um, and literally living in it moment by moment. We're being asked now to come in and live in the present. We can't live in the future because we don't know what that's going to look like. So um, it's very, when you find yourself in that state of anxiety around what the future might look like, I invite you to come back to this moment now. What is happening right now? Um, and I, like I said before, it could be as simple as, I need to brush my teeth or I need to make dinner for the kids. Um, it could be, you might want to plan your business for the future. You know, this is, this is the new, the way the new normal is. Maybe things are going to be more online. Maybe we need to develop an online program to support our Rotary Club members or whatever work it is that you, you do looking at if this was to happen, how could I best support that change? Um, so it all depends where, where you're at, whether you're a forward thinker, but if you're forward thinking in a state of anxiety or stress, that's not going to be helpful for you. Because you're not going to get in, it's not doing anything for you, right? All it's doing is physically making your body respond and your mind respond so that when something does come, uh, and I, I want to bring it back, really back to the basics. So my partner tends to, and I'm sure maybe some of you can relate to this, that, you know, what if this, plan A, plan B, plan C, just from normal day things. And he will literally get himself in a tizzy, I call it a tizzy, and, and then if they see that, then I'm going to have to do this, and, 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 Right? Then it comes to that moment and none of that stuff happened. So all he did for the two days prior, say to the said meeting was build him himself up, ready, ready for whatever was coming. And it was for nothing. He put himself through that state for nothing. Um, so the truth is it could be a positive thing or a negative thing. We don't know. I, I, from one, I prefer to think of what could the positives be? What are some of the good things that can come out of this? I'll tell you one thing. When, when, when this is over with, I'm giving my dad the biggest hug possible. And I'll tell you, especially on Easter Saturday, uh, you know, knowing that I can't be with my, it's my, my mom's uh, first uh, Easter without my mom and my family and my dad's by himself. I tell you, it's heart wrenching. And so I have a whole new appreciation. I always appreciated my family before, but I tell you, it, it's a whole new appreciation. And I hope I don't break his bones when I give him a big, big hug. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, and you do and, Easter dinner tonight virtually. Yeah, well, yeah. one of the, one of the, <laughs> one of the anx anxieties is watching seniors that are in you know at the time when people need it most, they're they're alone, and you know in nursing homes, you know nobody can go into a nursing home in in hospitals, whether it's for COVID nineteen or some other unrelated thing, you you can't visit people who really need you to be able to visit them, and that's a source of anxiety not for just the person but for their family. But ima imagine this. So I, I call my dad. How are you feeling today? How are you doing? Are you okay? Like I was going, oh, yeah, this is great. He says, oh, yeah, no one's bugging me. I get to do what I want. I'm writing my book I've always wanted to write. You know, it's almost the feeling of like maybe I'm bugging him by calling him all the time, right? So you got to remember that just because we feel a certain way doesn't mean that other person feels that way as well. So like that could be a good thing for my dad. Maybe he's going, you know, I really kind of enjoy this. And you know what? I'm not going to get sick because no one's coming around trying to give me anything, right? My big anxiety was trying to get my mom and dad an Easter ham. And I did it, you know, I did one of these uh, ship it or whatever. And I, they could not find a whole ham. So it ended up being like ham steaks. And I was all stressed out that they were going to get this and be so upset that they weren't getting their traditional ham. But I got the pineapple and whatever, and my mom got it. She's like, hey, it's just the two of us. Two big ham steaks, we're good. So I was like, phew, <laughs> I didn't disappoint them. Sue is one of those people who plans ahead for how she's going to worry. So I, I absolutely so agree. And I, and I get it because I can relate to you. I, I sent off a, a package and I made sure there was a few little alcoholic beverages in my in my dad's caregiving package. And I had it perfectly timed. I had to arrive there on Thursday and I, I'm following on the, the, the tracking. And next thing you know, it's, a, oh, it's on its way. Text my dad, dad, it's on its way. Well, sure enough. Don't they get to the door? And apparently they didn't ring it and they didn't know. Anyways, they took the package away. So now he's not going to get it till Monday or Tuesday and he's not even going to get it for Easter. So my point to this is here I was like literally so upset. Like I was like the one thing I could do for my dad was send in this care package and he's not getting it till after Easter. And my dad's like, don't worry about it. It's okay. I'll, 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 I'll drink and eat, eat on Tuesday. 
right? So for me, I was getting myself all worked up and all upset because that was what I was going through. So recognizing that everybody is, is has those experiences. And, and my dad's just grateful that eventually he'll have his nice big bottle, right? <laughs> Something to look forward to. Um, our, our friend Paul Jocks from the Trenton, Michigan uh, area wrote, uh, he finds walking his dog to be very helpful and uh, that they both benefit from that. Although there's memes of animals who are like, are you ever going to go out of here and leave me alone again? So I think that's... Well, Maggie, we have a Jack Russell, and she's she's actually come out here. She's here to me speak, and we usually compete over the seats. I swear, every time I go into the kitchen, she plops herself down where I was just sitting. I, <laughs> hey, what happened here? <laughs> but yes, going out for a walk, and, and thank goodness for pets, uh, really. And and uh, I have a girlfriend that works in uh, dog rescues, and uh, and even I, I I heard from someone too that the humane societies have a low. Um, uh, low number there now because people are going adopting uh, pets, etc. So if you have the capabilities and you need a companion uh, and, and you want to give care back to, to something else, by all means, uh, go, go for it. But yeah, it's an excuse to get out and get some fresh air because you might not feel like it, but that dog barking makes you kind of do it, right? Right, sure. Uh, Jacob uh, from Greencastle, Indiana, my new Facebook friend, uh, had an interesting uh, uh comment and question and Jacob if you can unmute yourself and uh, talk really quickly because I think this is uh, this is an area we hadn't really talked about but the, the, the issues that are going on with young people and uh, Jacob is a uh, uh, counselor for high school students you still with us Hi. Jacob yep I'm right here hopefully everybody can hear me yeah so I actually work for a community college in Indiana and <clears throat> one of my uh, roles is to recruit for a program um, and so that gets me in a lot of high schools, um, particularly the senior classes. Um, you know, they're all kind of shocked by this sudden, um, oh, our year is over, you know, no prom, no graduation. And I'm friends with a, a couple families with seniors as well. And I uh, consistently get this, oh, we're so bored and oh, you know, poor me type of stuff. Um, you know, and I'm somebody that, you know, I can go out in the yard and do work. I can, you know, I guess naturally I can entertain myself. So I've always sort of operated even with my students in the college program, you know, I won't feel sympathy for you. I'm going to try and empathize with you. So I don't know if you can just comment on, you know, really the difference between the two and if sympathy is ever appropriate, because I just find it very hard to be sympathetic because I feel like that can be a waste of time. Um, so I don't know if you could just kind of comment from more of a professional uh, perspective on that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jacob. So, so empathy drives connection and sympathy drives disconnection. Um, there's a, a video that you can find on YouTube by Brene Brown, and it's excellent two and a half. I usually share it in, in my sessions as well, two and a half minute video. And it really talks about, you know, what, how we do when we're trying to make someone feel better. Like that's, I call it a silver liner right? Um, well, come on, like, come on and get outside and let's plant some flowers. Meanwhile, the person's going, I, I don't feel like planting flowers and I've never planted a flower and I'm not doing it. And so when we put, again, our own belief systems and our positivity when, onto someone that's maybe not feeling very positive, that's actually causing harm. Um, so, so, you know, and, and it's at least, well, uh, you know, uh, the famous one is, uh, uh, you know, John and I are getting divorced. Well, at least you got married. Right. Or Sarah, Sarah's, um, you know, uh, failing their exams this year. Well, at least at least John, your other kid is an A student. Right. So it's always trying to make it better or make it look better and, and give that silver lining. So when, when we talk about being empathetic to others and to ourselves is not putting your own um, beliefs onto someone else, actually creating a space for listening, just really being with them. It's not for your job to fix them. It's not your job to try tell them something that's going to make them feel better. Just the fact that you're connecting with them and really listening to them and not judging their experience, that is supportive and helping them and that's providing empathy. So, um, some, yeah, sim sympathy, uh, you know, it's a tricky one, you know, uh, you know, so sorry, your, your elder parent died while well, they were only, you know, they were like 90 something years old. They had a good life. I mean, imagine how that might make you feel right. Um, so putting your own, uh, trying to make people feel better and saying things, it, 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 you're better off saying something like, you know, right now, I don't know what to say to you. Um, I, I, I wish I could make this better for you, but just know that I'm here for you. And that would be an, a, a great example of empathy and, and expressing that for someone. 
Yeah, that's, uh, a, 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 you know, the sympathy, you can express sympathy, but when you start then projecting those additional comments, that's, I think, when you get into trouble, and I'm yeah. sorry for doing that. But, um, thanks, Jacob. That's a, that was a great, a great comment on that. Tom Jenkins is also talking about uh, the need to, to how, do we, how do we help survivors? I mean, there's going to be a lot of post-traumatic stress for, for the frontline workers, the healthcare workers, the hospital workers, and so on. What, what do you do for the survivors? Because we're so concentrated on the, you know, trying to, to help others right now. Yeah. And the sur survivors um, are frontline people and they're ourselves too, right? Um, and that survivor's guilt, um, you know, that, that I survived, why didn't they? Um, and, and yes, uh, you know, one of the risks coming out of COVID-19 is that uh, a post-traumatic stress disorder or acute stress disorder. So one of the things I do teach in our mental health first aid basic course is um, how to support someone. So we go through a whole, um, you know, like for example, in first aid, physical first aid, uh, there's the A, B, C. So you go right into the airways and the breathing and then the circulation. Um, we do a similar thing, although it's, the, it's not, it, it's, it's, actions as opposed to steps so it's called algae so a l g e e and we start off we assess uh, the risk of suicide or harm to themselves or others. Then we go into listening non-judgmentally, which I spoke briefly about. This is over two-day period, so I've given you little tidbits, but this is uh, we do extensive work on listening non-judgmentally and how to support someone that might be going through this. Uh, G stands for give reassurance and information, um, and and giving reassurance that this is not uh, um, this is a common. Uh, response to what is happening and, and I say common versus normal because when something uh, it's not normal not everybody is going to go through a, a PTSD after this um, but it is a common response so just re letting them know that this isn't something that they're not defected or there's a default with them um, that this is circumstances that that's impacted them in this way um, and then the first E stands for encouraging uh, appropriate professional help so when you go to my website mentalhealthtrainer.ca and you go to the toolbox I have a whole bunch of resources there that supports those um, that those that might be going through PD PTSD anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts. Um, there's a whole, uh, um, on that webinar page, the link I'll be sending you has all those resources as well. And then the second E, or the second E is uh, encouraging uh, other support. So other support can be friends, family, coworkers, community uh, networks. Um, uh, I, I always recommend at the end of, of this, or you find that someone might be going through uh, PTSD, and of course we go through all what that might look like, the signs and symptoms, symptoms, um, have them go to their family or connect with their family physician and doctor, because if they can't help you, they're going to have the best person that can help you and refer you. Um, my name's Rachel. I'm from Michigan in um, Belleville. What we've been um, talking about is when this is all over and done, we have people that are going to be afraid to come to Rotary meetings. We are going to be having people that are going to be afraid to come to our fundraising events. What do we do about things like that to reassure them that everything's going to be? Well, it, 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 I mean, we can't reassure them right now that everything's going to be okay because we, we don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know the, the timeline, but we can put things in place. So, um, you know, I, I believe if you look at the grocery stores now, I think those, those, uh, I don't know if you have this where you are, but the plexiglass uh, barriers, I think they're going to be up permanently. I don't think they're ever coming down. I think we've really had a lesson around um, passing on viruses and sicknesses, etc. So I think those kinds of things are going to change. So as far as your meetings, putting things in place where you have the sanitizer stations when you go in, you have masks available on hand that they can use if they feel it's necessary for them. You can, uh, you know, put things in place of if you, if you travel, once we get back to traveling, if you travel out of the country in the past 14 days, maybe this isn't the meeting for you to come or if you have symptoms going on at home uh, to stay home. Um, things like introducing more Zoom meetings, perhaps have live stream or, or th those that, that, you know, I don't know, I need that human connection. I'm going to go for it. And they show up. And those that don't feel comfortable, rather than trying to convince them to feel comfortable, how about including them in a different way than they're used to? So it could be having a live stream or having a Zoom meeting, having a, a, a computer set up on the wall, a TV plugged into the computer with HDMI cable so they can still feel like they're part of the action. Definitely. Okay, good.
It's definitely one of the reasons why we've been trying to encourage people to still meet and have virtual meetings so that the connections stay in place. Um, but I agree with that. On the other side of this, I'm not sure we know yet, but I know things will be different. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, not that we knew this was going to happen, but even this kind of passport club thing that we're trying to do, having this electronic gathering, uh, we were ahead of our time at the time that we started doing it. But I think this, this is going to be part of what the new Rotary might look like in many places. Mm -hmm. yeah. or it could, and it could be a combination of both as well, right? So yeah. doesn't, remember, it doesn't have to be an either or. It doesn't have to be this way or that way. So we're being invited to really look at other options of, and, and another way of doing life, really. Um, and, and, and it might not be a bad thing. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I cannot thank Suzanne and you enough. This was um, by far um, one of the best passport club meetings we've ever had. And uh, uh, you made me feel better today. So thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I'm so pleased. Appreciate it, Yvette. Thanks for being with us. You're welcome to stay for the, uh, the balance of our meeting, which will just be a few minutes here. First of all, I'm going to call on our district governor, John Chambers, if he has any uh, words of wisdom or greetings he'd like to bring uh, to the group this morning. Um, Let's just get you unmuted, John. Yeah, I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, the meeting was extremely important. I've participated in many uh, Zoom meetings and a couple go-to meetings for the clubs. Uh, the clubs are doing a variety of activities. Some clubs are using funds. Some clubs are using funds and people to do a, a variety of things to help people out in the community. And that, that's extremely important. We're very active and I think we need to know that a little bit too. Uh, so I want to pass that on to people. Uh, we're looking at some funding issues for the clubs to do a variety of things. And we'll be coming out with that, I think probably in the next couple weeks. So stay tuned. Perfect. John, thanks so much. And uh, obviously, uh, for all of us, um, we have had to rethink the way we're doing things. So thanks for leading that charge. Um, the other person I wanted to introduce who, who came onto the line is our district governor-elect, um, District Governor-elect Noel Jackson. He will be taking over the helms of our district on the 1st of July. And I know he's on the phone, too, if you want to say hi, Noel. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, I've been just sitting back here, uh, really taking a lot of this in and, and uh, doing some personal analysis. But w one of the things that, that comes to me, you start thinking about how you feel about it. And of course, we all have our, our, our egocentric uh, view on life. But we are all connected worldwide with this virus. And so we're all in this together. And I think that's one of the things that the Rotary needs to look at and figure out is, you know, what is the, the effect of this in terms of collectively bringing us all together? Um, and beyond that, uh, we just keep, have to keep striving to make our connections and look at the possibilities that are available to us. And with the, uh, the new, uh, I, I had the, the website for uh, connecting to be able to do things, uh, you know, going to that and getting involved with these different things. We're going to learn so many things through this. Uh, and I'll tell you, uh, as a district governor-elect, uh, I'm really reformulating the way that I'm going to be looking at this next year and helping to, uh, as a leader, try and formulate ways to go forward to make Rotary more effective. Thanks, Noel, appreciate that. Yeah, it's gonna be, uh, as Yvette and everybody else is talking about, it's gonna be a little different way of operating. It doesn't mean a bad way, it just means a different way. So we appreciate you uh, yeah. being Sometimes up. called the new normal, Bruce. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know we were ever normal to begin with, so I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> looking forward to any kind of normal, that's fine. Um, thanks, Noel. Uh, First of all, before I forget, we have uh, Big Rich Churchman on with us this morning. Big Rich from Louisiana, and it's also this week was his birthday. So everybody, quick a uh, quick uh, happy birthday to uh, Big Rich. Um, happy everybody. birthday, Rich. Happy birthday, Rich. Uh, happy, happy, uh, birthday, happy birthday, Rich. If you ever go to a, a Rotary International Convention, you won't be able to go to the one this year, but if you ever go to one, you will know Big Rich. He's always one of the sergeant-at-arms uh, 
and and he, you'll know where he got his name big rich when you uh, when you see him so thanks for joining us this morning um we uh, He's also are, a dentist he is also a dentist, that's right, and uh, as you are, Noel. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Didn't hear you, Russ, say that again? Not that there's anything wrong with being a dentist. No. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Speaking of normal, um, we're going to close this morning with our past district governor, Liz Smith. Liz, uh, among her many, 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 many talents, um, knows uh, a good deal of sign language, and she's going to give us a brief lesson in signing this morning, which you can even do muted. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, past district governor, Liz. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so the first useful thing for uh, Zoom participation is that in sign language, this is applause. So thanks to everybody for being here today. Yay for you. And it's a, so that's kind of fun. Um, I had the opportunity to learn the four-way test, to sign the four-way test from a woman who is a native sign speaker um, who I met at the Central States Youth Exchange Conference when we helped her uh, find the best seating so that she could enjoy the program as well as see her interpreter. And so she taught me the four-way test. If anyone on the call is uh, better at this than I am, I will say that any errors that I have learned did not come from her. There are errors that I've applied, <laughs> but I did learn this from her and she's a native speaker. The important thing to know about sign language is that it is a language so it, signed English is a different thing. Signed English is where you, you apply a sign to every word. Sign language is interpreting the language into uh, a collection of signs. So when you see this, you're going to say, well, that's not enough words. Um, but it is because it is the language and it is you're interpreting the thought and the ideas and not every single word. So stick with me. I'm going to do it first, and then I'll invite you to join in. Um, so first, first finger, always thumb down. So first, is it the truth? So this is your H hand. Is it the truth? Second, your second finger, is it fair? We bring things to a level. Is it fair to all? concerned. Third, will it build goodwill and friendships better? So this, in sign language, this is better, this is best. So depending on how important you feel, you can raise it up higher. Friendships better, friendships best. And fourth, uh, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And I like to interpret this one as, what's in it for me, what's in it for you? <laughs> so, all together now, first, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships, or best friendships. And fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Well done, everybody. Thank you, Liz. And as usual, just like when I dance, I always use the wrong foot. I now use the wrong hand when I'm doing this. So, uh, you know, it's, I, it, it's interesting. I originally learned to sign from someone who is left-handed which is perfect because you're learning it right-handed um, because you're looking at them like in a mirror. I, it's now all mixed up. As I see myself here, it's in the mirror, but as you see me, it's not. So you are I, or aren't left or right-handed as you have learned this. <laughs> totally confused, totally confused. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Liz. Thanks to Yvette. Thanks to everybody who joined us. We. Uh, we were up to almost 60 uh, participants this morning from all around the, uh, the North America, certainly. I'm not sure if we had any uh, international guests uh, outside of the North American continent, but we're glad to have everybody with us this morning. Uh, great chats in the uh, chat box. If you haven't had a chance to look at those, um, please do that. 
And once again, this meeting will be uh, posted on our Passport Club YouTube channel. Uh, if you need the link for that, just go to, to our Passport Club Facebook group. Um, if you uh, go to Facebook and you search for 6400 Passport Club uh, Rotary, you will uh, find our page and our group. And then uh, if you haven't joined the group yet, please do so as well. Next week, we're going to have another special guest outside. He's kind of inside Rotary, but he's outside Rotary for what his discussion is going to be. And that's a good friend of Sue and mine named Steve Schramm. Steve is the, uh, the head of Michigan Public Media, which is both uh, Michigan Public Television and Radio out of Ann Arbor. And uh, that place that Liz knows so well, the University of Michigan. Uh, Steve it was a commercial broadcaster uh, for many, many years, in the, mostly in the Detroit area, and now he's been overseeing for several years uh, public media in Michigan, and he's going to talk to us about the, the broadcaster response to uh, COVID-19 in particular in the few, and how broadcasters uh, serve their, their communities as well, a topic near and dear, of course, to Sue and my uh, hearts as well. So we're looking forward to that same time, same, time, same place next week. Uh, we'll post updates on the, uh, uh, the web page of the Facebook group. Our website as well, I'll write that in the chat box to everybody here. Uh, so you can all see it is 6400passport.org. So please uh, join us as well. Uh, we will uh, look forward to having you uh, join our group. And like I said, we're going to be get posting information about uh, our chartering over the next uh, few weeks and working with Rotary International on that as well. Um, we're also going to be, uh, after next week's meeting with Steve Schramm from Michigan Public Media, we're going to be having a series of special Rotary speakers that uh, we're working with uh, Rotary Foundation trustee and past RI Vice President Jennifer Jones to secure right now. So uh, make sure you reserve uh, 9 o'clock Eastern time on uh, Saturday mornings for these meetings because we're, uh, we're looking forward to some great things going forward. So with that, we'll uh, do the usual chaos that we love to do here. I'm going to unmute everybody and encourage you to join us in the spoken or signed version of the four-way test of all the things that we think, say, or do. First, is it is the truth? Second, and to fair to all concerned. Third, build goodwill and friendship. Fourth, be beneficial to all concerned. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Rotary week. Appreciate you being online with us. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, Happy Passover, and we will uh, see you next week. Have a great week.